Okay, so welcome to our week 10, which is going to cover compression backup and uh, software installation. And so let's, uh, let's start talking about compression. Compression is very important to us. Why? Why do we compress files? Or in what circumstances do we compress files? Okay, companies impose data caps. Now, data caps as far as your storage, maybe. Okay, so you have a shared drive or a network drive, and they're saying you're only allowed a gigabyte of space, right? Uh, any other reasons? Why else do we compress files? Yes? Okay, we compress files so they will fit in your email attachment because, again, companies will impose uh, size limitations. Now, as far as size limitation in an attachment for an email, there's a good reason for it, right? If you end up attaching, uh, say, 15 pictures of your dog that you just took with the 8 megabit uh, megapixel camera, and you just copied the pictures right from the camera, what's going to happen to, to your email? Your upload time, how about that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, depending on where you're at, at two hours. So it'll take a long time. So here's the thing. In addition to disk space issues, we compress files because of network capacities. In fact, if you look at the HTTP conversation between servers and browsers, most of the servers are going to uh, try to compress HTML, uh, JavaScript, before they send it to you. So here's how it happens. You send a request to the server. Inside of HTTP, there's a header that's going to say deflate, which means that you are supporting, your browser supports compression mechanism in form of deflate, which is an algorithm. So now the server knows not to send you clear text. And suddenly, your network connectivity will seem faster. See how that works? So if you, uh, now that doesn't matter maybe on your DSL line, uh, to have a few JavaScripts compressed. But if you're on the phone and you have only two bars of data, well, suddenly you are okay with uh, the server compressing it, sending to you compressed, then your phone spinning a few wheels and decompressing it. So network transfer is very important, um, and, and that's why we compress uh, files a lot of times. Email attachments are a great example. It'll take forever to upload, and then it'll take forever for Google to handle that transfer. And then it'll take forever for your grandma to look, you know, as the email a download. So nobody's happy in that situation. So let's look at some uh, compression mechanisms. Uh, we're going to start with a utility called compress. And if you if if you uh, type in com C O M P R E and press tab, and you do not see the word compress be filled in, that means that compress utility is not installed on your server. <coughs> How can you install Compress on your system? How would you go about this whole process? Okay, so the, the easy way is to use yum, and so you say yum install. But, but how do you know what to say next? <laughs> right, I'll tell you. So you can't just say Compress, because Compress is one of the many commands that the package might include. So you have to find out what the package name is. And, and uh, the package is actually called ncompress. Um, the easiest way to find out what the package is is just to Google it. You say compress package Red Hat, and it'll tell you. Uh, there are uh, other ways. Uh, later on, I'll show you uh, the RPM command, how you can find out uh, what's installed or, or uh, what requires or what provides. Yes? Great, yes, yes. So they tried to automate this further. The first step was that you would install software, and then the libraries that you had on your system would conflict with that software, which was bad. The next step was the RPM, Red Hat Package Manager, which created a database of dependencies. So suddenly, you would install libraries, then you install software, but RPM would tell you whether they are in sync, which was great, because now, if you had it working, it always worked well. 
okay? Before, even though you didn't have dependency issues, things were broken because they were the wrong versions of libraries. And then the step where we are at right now, you can say yum install and compress, and you see yum's gonna resolve those dependencies for you. It, it not only will tell you, okay, you still need five other libraries, it'll go ahead and, and download it for you automatically. So you can see that kind of evolution of, of this uh, package kit system. Uh, and yes, we're, we're in, in Fedora, they're trying to automate that further where you don't have to actually say yum install package. You try to use a command and they'll try to make that happen for you. So anyway, you can run this command. I can rerun it. Uh, and as I am rerunning it, it says it's already installed. Now, yum is not going to work very well if you're not connected to the internet. So make sure that those two computers right here are lit. If you have a, an X across, then just left click and then click on system E0 to enable your internet connectivity. All right. So first of all, I'm going to create a directory here. Uh, I'll call, call that test. Uh, make directory test. OK, great. Go to test. And now we're going to um, create a file. Because to compress something, we want to have a file to compress. One way to create a file um, is to um, maybe use something like uh, cat dev zero into my file. Okay? And, and the longer I let the run, the larger the file gets. So if sometimes if you need a really large file created, you can do it that way. So now if I stop it by pressing Control C, I can actually see a file. Okay, it's an, it's an empty file. The file just has uh, zeros in it. Another way to create a file, I could say Etsy, uh, I'm sorry, cat Etsy services. Etsy services happens to be a very important file which allows us to map port numbers to humanly readable services. So for example, if I go to port 80, it tells me, oh, it's HTTP. So when you run that stat, you can choose whether you want to see the numbers or what do those ports actually mean. So, and because this is a quite a large of a file, it has, uh, Etsy services has um, 10,000 lines, right? So we can say uh, cat Etsy services into my uh, big file, that txt. And if I redirect this like so, and then we run it a few times, right? Then I'm also producing a quite, uh, quite large file. Uh, I have now 14 mags. The small difference between these files is that my file has only one character in it uh, versus uh, my big file has numbers, characters, and things like that. Okay, so let's try to compress these files. I could use our first utility, which is compress. And I'll go ahead and try to compress my file. My file has 300, uh, 324 megabytes. Um, I will say dash V so that we can see what the level of compression is. And so when I run it, the file is getting compressed. And we were able to compress it at an uh, amazingly high ratio of compression, 99%. And so out of 324 megabyte file, I had a 44K. Right, you don't see that very often, but let's just say when you have a simple file, that's what happens. So instead, uh, let's uh, compress the 14 meg file. And uh, uh, let me make a, yes, question. Sorry, what was the, the option for? For, uh, see this, this uh, information right here? That's what it produces. It's verbose, oh. and it just tells me more about, about it, and even told me that it replaced the file. Okay. So f uh, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to make a copy of my 14 meg file, and now I'll r run compress on, on that file. Okay? And so you can see that now I had no dash V, therefore the, there was no verbose information. But this file compressed to about 4.2 megabytes, see, and that's because it has some real characters in it, and so to compress it well, you sort of have to do some legwork, and you can't just compress it at 99% um, rate. But that, that's, that's a pretty big gain. 
So most of our log files would be compressed with this um, compression uh, system. Uh, it's using lample ZIF compression algori algorithm, which is fairly old. Um, so we can see that dot Z at the end of the file, therefore telling us it was compressed with a specific mechanism. Now we know what command to use to undo this. There is a command called zcat, which allows us to look right into a compressed file, which is very useful. Because imagine that you may have um, a 5 gig log file. Now you compressed it, and so it's smaller, maybe you know 800 meg. And so before viewing it, okay, if you think about decompressing it, then you're going to have 5 gigs of disk space swallowed just by that activity. So instead of that, for an old log file that's been compressed, you can use Zcat to look inside of it. See, and that's, that, that will really save you time and, and, and space. Yeah, so let's compress. Let's look at another, uh, yes, question? You want to have it in your cake and eat it too. Um, so once you compress a file, it, it, you can keep the original copy, yes, and you can have the new compressed copy. But the compressed copy is always rewritten. So most applications are lazy, okay? Uh, say uh, uh, a, a word, uh, not word, but let's say a word processor application. It is not concerned with the size of the file at least not very concerned with it, because when it has a letter A to write, it takes that letter A and puts it in the file. It doesn't do a very good job of saying, okay, instead of storing this as a character, let's store it as a binary uh, digit and create some extra code to make it small. It just basically uh, figures on uh, using whatever encoding you asked for and, and it'll store it. So. Most files that we work with, be that PDFs or, or, or Word files, they are going to be really a little bit larger in space. There will be uh, uh, new line characters, empty lines, uh, comments included. So wh when you compress, the compression algorithm is going to look for patterns. It'll say, the next line is 100 zeros. So instead of actually typing in 100 zeros, you're going to say 100 of zeros and that's much shorter. And so it look for those patterns, it has an algorithm to do that with, but unfortunately in that form, when compressed, it is not readable back to your word processor application or to your image viewer software. Okay. Having said that, especially in graphics, because file sizes can be so large, uh, many files already will include compression. So JPEG, right? You take your raw file coming from, from a camera, and most photographers prefer the raw format because they're not sure what they're going to have to do with the picture. Um, my uh, sister-in-law is a photographer, and she, in a group of people, right, she'll move eyes from one picture to the other or the entire head because people close their eyes or you know, can't see them very well. So that post-op um, uh, post uh, uh, manipulation is, is huge, and so they want to work with high-quality pictures. The moment you save it to JPEG, that algorithm, because it's a little bit old, it is going to remove data. It's a, uh, it produces loss of data. So it'll remove elements so that it, the file is smaller. It's still, to a naked eye, it's, it's viewable OK if you don't, if you don't blow it up too, too high. Newer algorithms like PNG okay, allow you to compress very deeply, but they will keep most of the data. Okay? So, so they, they'll, they'll compress uh, deeply so that the applications, be that Paint or Photoshop or, or, or GIMP, they are going to work with the compressed data. See, and, and, and so they are now more mindful that we can't just write the way it's, so it's faster. Uh, the size of the file really matters. Uh, and so I'll show you with, uh, maybe with GZIP. So, um, so with gzip, for example, I can say, go ahead and compress this file, my big file, okay? And if I just issue this command with no other parameters, then it is going to replace the original file, okay? But I could say, go ahead and, uh, and gzip, 
uh, and make sure to uh, to create a new a new file. Now this might not work, so give me a moment if if it doesn't. Okay, so that doesn't work, and the other part works. Um, G unzip. Give me back my uh, my big file. Okay, and now man on gzip. How do we provide destination? Let's see. Gzip. Uh, by the way, did you notice that zcat is compatible with multiple uh, compression methods? So that's that's really nice. Um, so it was c compatible with ample zip. Um, and um, let's see. Gz. Somewhere here, there's going to be a method. Maybe preserve, force decompress. Okay, ASCII, decompress, force help. No name, name quiet, recursive. Test verbose, fast, fast. Hmm. Well, I have to look it up. I'm, I'm sure there's a way to actually keep the file. Um, but basically, let, let's do this. Let's make another copy. So I'll have to look look, look this uh, look this up. But let's make a copy. Let's create another big file here. And um, when that's over, we'll we'll run gzip on it. Two. All right. And so the the gzip it's the same file we're compressing, right? Gzip has it. Uh, is is ahead of compress, right? It's ahead of compress. Uh, let's see, man compress, um, and so it's using lempel zip here. Uh, but apparently, gzip is is it, it's a newer um, newer utility, and it compresses at higher level. Gzip is often included inside of other utilities. Okay, uh, let me show you here a way to use tar, and tar is one of our methods of backing up files. Tar is beautiful because it is going to do things recursively. It can do things without compression, but it can include compression. And it's going to keep the files, the permissions on the files, and the ownership on the file. Most of the time, if you just say copy, you're going to take a file from one place and recreate it in a new place. And when you create that file, default security is applied and your user is put as the owner. TAR is different. See, with TAR, you can restore the original permissions. So with TAR, you can say, go ahead and uh, create a new file. Make sure to use gzip compression. Uh, be verbose about it and use the file name. So let's say uh, we're going to say mybig.tgz. So gz comes from our gzip. And TGZ, because it's tar, sometimes it's expressed as tar.gz. It's called a tarball as well. And now we'll provide the name of our file. Now, in this instance, my original file will be in place. Okay. So when I run this, my original file is in place, and, um, and my new file is here. So it's the same method. So this file and this file are the same in, in space because we're using the same algorithm. I could instead use, instead of a Z, I can use a J. And J would be using uh, the deflate or what zip uses. Okay. And so let's show how this might work. If I say zip, and now I say, uh, go ahead and, and zip. Um, uh, my big dot zip my big file three okay and so now the zip okay is going to be right here let's see man zip um, Okay. 
So the deflate is the method uh, that's defaulted. So, all right. Okay, so we looked at compress, we looked at gzip. I showed you how to compress a single file with tar. And now let's look at bzip2. So here's another compression um, utility. bzip2 on my big file, uh, file3. I run the utility, and now notice the bzip2 being the newest utility, and it's using uh, a different uh, algorithm. It's using the borrows wheeler alg algorithm, okay? And it is more effective, right? So it can compress deeper than, um, than um, uh, the deflate or the lampel zip. So think about compression being like compressing your garbage. Okay, you're not changing the weight of it. Okay? It's not a chemical uh, reaction. You are changing the physical property where you're changing the, the volume, but the weight is the same. So with compression, what we're doing is we're more making each character more meaningful. So every zero, every one is more meaningful, uh, and that's how we change the size. Uh, so, um, so that's... Um, that's how that's how compression works. And again, browsers today are going to compress things on the fly automatically, so that um, we save the network uh, capacity. Yes. Is it different compression algorithm for Yes. Yes. So, uh, if you use text files, and I don't have that uh, the table <laughs> uh, memorized, which one is better for which one? But some binary files are compressed better with, with different algorithms than text files. In general, though, newer algor algorithms will be better in general, you know, uh, because in the past, CPUs were slower. So, you know, they were happy with whatever gain was in space, but they could not wait two hours for a file to be compressed. Today, we have more CPU to work with, so we can take it to the other extreme where, hey, just work really hard, make sure it's really small, and then, then output it. Okay, so that is, um, that's compression. If we look at uh, the GUI and we navigate to my home directory and then to the test folder, notice that the GUI recognizes each of these files as a compressed file. So if you forget the utilities, you can go ahead and double click on this kind of a package icon and uh, Nautilus is going to go ahead and, and do the, the work for you. So you can decompress any of these files. All right, very well. So let's talk about uh, uh, a related subject, which is backup. Obviously, we run backups on systems for many reasons. Some of those reasons have to do with hardware failures, and some of those reasons have to do with users making mistakes, right? Uh, and, and then. So users are directed by someone else, and, and, and they never make mistakes, but they get commands, they get told things to do. So then you need to restore. And um, a lot of times we don't, we don't have the ability to go to the backup and just grab one file. So what, what you'll end up doing is you'll restore maybe a whole directory or a whole file system on a development system or some secondary box, and then copy the file back to production. Having said that, there are uh, software packages and hardware that are uh, produced by IBM, like the Tivoli uh, storage um, backup system. And uh, you basically buy the backup tapes. You, you, you buy a little robot that basically <laughs> moves the tapes around and exchanges them every so often so you have new tapes in the right places. And then you get commands on your Linux prompt for using that storage. And then, See, in those advanced backup uh, software uh, mechanisms, you can specifically say, go nine days back and bring me this file. And then the robot in the back in the data center picks the right tape, plugs it in, reads it in, and allows you to, to get the file. Okay. So EMC, other big companies all have backup systems. And so you just have to follow the manual and the command, commands that are given by the company. So by, by a default or out of the box, Linux comes with a couple of backup systems. Uh, one is called TAR. 
Backup system is a little bit too much, okay? Just say commands that can be used for backup. So tar, tar is very old uh, and, and uh, very popular across uh, uh, both uh, open source and proprietary uh, Unix systems. So you can use this on AIX, on HPUX. So it's, it's a good uh, a command to be familiar with. A lot of times it's not just backup we're talking about. Let's say that you are creating something on the production system and you had this brilliant thought that, okay, if I change it now and it doesn't work, someone's going to call me, right? So let's just tar this entire directory or this whole application and move it to my development system, play with it there, and then bring it back or make the change on the production system once I tested it. So you're going to use tar not just for the kind of disaster recovery uh, backup, but you'll use tar to maybe create a version of your application. You're writing PHP 3 in the morning and you're figuring it's a good time to make a copy of this. So you do a tar and you, it all gets put into a single file. So let's see how, how this works. Uh, I have... Um, uh, let me let me go ahead and create here uh, a new directory. We'll call that production. And inside of production, I'll uh, copy here Etsy services. I'll create a uh, directory like bin, directory maybe like um, config. Okay, so we have a, some kind of a small application installed here. And the idea is, I would like to put all these files into a single file. You can do that with gzip, you can do it with zip. Any of those uh, can recursively um, archive files. So we, we do two things with tar. One is archive, which means that we put together multiple files, multiple directories into one file. That's archiving. And then extracting is the opposite. And then we can also compress and decompress. Okay, so let's go ahead and use star, and we'll say C, V, F. C stands for create, V is for verbose, and F means uh, file name will follow. You can work with standard input uh, for uh, with tar, which means that you use the pipe symbol to say cat this file, pipe into tar, and tar can, can capture that information, or tar can uh, create output so that it can be accepted by another application. But when you use F, it means you're working with actual files. So now we're going to create a file called backup.tar, and we'll put production. And so now I have a single, single file called backup.tar, which basically put together uh, all these files. If I was to go ahead and check how big production is, production is 644K in size total. And therefore, when I use the tar command without any compression, it's the same size because it just archived all the files together. The, there's no compression done at this point. So let's add compression. Now we're going to say tar-cz for gzip compression or j for, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the deflate. And we would say czvf backup.tar.gz, you see now that it's compressed, we indicate that on, on the file, uh, or we can just make that shorter and say .tgz. And so we run this, and so now when we preview the files, the compressed file is smaller as we expected. But basically, we archived, we put all kinds of files together into one, and then we compress that. Okay, I can now use the tar command to say something like tar-t, uh, which means list the files in the archive and, and don't, don't open the archive, don't, don't extract anything. So tvf on backup.tar, okay, and now it just shows me what files I have inside, just for preview, preview needs. Okay, so that's tar, and, uh, and tar is very, very useful. Uh, the next utility that's included on a, on a uh, Linux system is dump, okay? And dump allows you to back up an entire device. So your dev SDA or dev HDA, you can do a backup of it. 
And because it's working at, uh, at the device level, you can further say, do a full backup today. Tomorrow, do an incremental backup. So only backup the bits that have changed. And the next day, do another incremental, another incremental. Why would we do that? Why do incremental? Why bother with that? Save space, yeah, because you do not lose the ability to restore your Tuesday backup, right? You still have the ability to do that, only it takes a little bit longer because you have to first restore Sunday, then you restore the incremental from Monday, then incremental from Tuesday, and you're there. Only you don't have, to, so let's say it, it's a 100 gig, it's, 100 gig is fairly small for, for a database server, so let's say it's a 100 gig device, if you did a full backup every day, you have to have 700 gig disk space. If you're doing incremental, it will be 100 gig plus maybe 10, 20 gig per of the other days. So you can see the savings are, are, are quite a bit. And the other benefit is that the impact on your system is, is less. Let's say that your backup is running, when you copy, uh, everything that you have, <laughs> your discs are, go are going to be busy. So now your customers are connecting to your online app, they're trying to buy the shoes that you're selling, and it's slow. And maybe there's an, a timeout error, and they go to Zappos. They lose their passwords there. Um, but uh, uh, you may lose a customer when that happens. So incremental backups are nice, because you run them when you don't expect high user activity. So let's say Sunday night. Uh, and then you run Throughout the busy days, you only run incremental. So it's much, much shorter. So Dump will do that for us, and, uh, and you can schedule it to, uh, to, to, to do the incremental uh, backups. Uh, again, most of the time, what I have seen is that instead of backing up the entire device, uh, administrators will back up only the database, only the directories that have applications, only the data. Okay, because let's say that your server does crash, okay, likelihood of, of, of you going back to the backup and restoring it on a separate server from the backup, restoring the operating system from the backup, are low. Okay, unless you keep two exact the same boxes with the same hardware inside, the new box might be different. So now the drivers don't match perhaps, or uh, you know, it has uh, one more disk uh, than the other. So most likely, the process of disaster recovery will be, first of all, okay, so we lost our server. Okay, that's bad. Let's find one that's already working, <laughs> maybe the test system, and uh, you know, we, we remove the test data and go to backup to put in the production data. Maybe the software is already installed there, and we're up and running, okay? Uh, or maybe we uh, do have to install the OS on, on a separate box. So we install the OS, and then we go ahead and go to backup to get the data. That will be the quickest way of getting things restored. And very reliable because now your OS is running correctly on the system. Uh, what happens most of the time is hardware failure are fairly predictable. So we know that disks will fail first. Uh, you know, uh, memory often fails too. The other pieces tend to be live much longer. So. Uh, the servers will live probably today about five years. I mean, after that, they are too old, really, to have them in production. So for disk, uh, for disk re uh, uh, reliability, we have swap disk, right? So this disk fails. We're already mirroring the disks. So I can just call up IBM and remove the broken disk, put a blank one in, and they sync. So you don't have to go to the backup at all to deal with, with a disk failure. If it's memory failure, then you shut down the box, remove a chip, turn it back on, and then wait for the new chip to come in. And then you shut down again and put the new chip in. So uh, there are very few situations where you actually have to replace the entire system. Uh, say you get hacked, and, and, and you have to turn the box off. You, you, you give it for, to forensics. The box is gone. You have to you know, deal with, with installing it onto a new server. So that's why I've seen uh, most of the time people not backing up the operating system, but backing up only the, uh, the data that, that's running on it. OK, so that's, that's our backup. Um, any questions about backup?
Again, most of the time, if you are working in an environment, they probably bought into a backup solution, so their, the commands are going to be slightly different anyway. But as long as you, you get the um, principles of compression of a backup and then the incremental backups, uh, then, then, then you're ahead. So now, let's talk about software installation process. There are three main ways of installing software. Um, you can install software on Linux from scratch, which means from source code. You can install it as an RPM. Finally, you can install it with YUM. So let's see how, how, this, might, uh, how this might work. First, we're going to insta install software as an RPM. Where do we find RPMs? The internet. The internet. Very good. So we do find, uh, and you know what? There is a website called uh, RPM Find. And on this website, you can say, OK, I'm looking for Z shell, which is just like Bash shell, only, only different. And now it tells me, hey, I have all these different RPMs. What, uh, what system would you like to install it on? Right, so that's really neat. And it just shows you the different systems that are using the uh, RPM, Red Hat Package Manager uh, system. Of course, the, the danger of using websites like this is that you might be installing RPM that was tinkered with. So uh, you can download RPMs from repositories, because that's what Yamans are doing. And then you can use RPMs which are right on the CD. See, on the installation CD-ROM, we have packages directory. And in packages directory, we have all the RPMs that make up our operating system. So the installation process actually works with RPMs to do this. When an RPM is being installed, you see, it's not just a process of copying files. RPM is a fairly robust system that allows you to run a script ahead of time, pre-configure uh, certain things allows you to copy files, then allows you to run scripts afterwards, maybe to start a service or to configure the software that you just installed. Okay, so there's a number of things that happens. And most of all, RPM maintains the database of all the dependencies and all the software that's installed. So then it will insert its information in, in the database. So the first command that we want to know about RPM is RPM QA. RPM QA will list all the software that you install on, on the system. So of course, you can, you can say RPM QA and then pipe into grep, and let's say you're looking for, for the Z shell. And so it happens to, to be installed there. Next, if you would like to remove software, you can say RPM dash E and remove the Z shell. So you can use RPM to to remove software. A lot of times, it'll say, I can't remove the software because it's needed for some other package, especially with development libraries and things like that. You can use RPM dash dash force, right? And so then you're saying, OK, um, I, I'm going to break this dependency, possibly break some other software, but I really want that gone. Right? And so it, RPM will allow you to do that. OK, so let's see how we might install this software back. We're going to go to Media, Fedora, um, no, Fedora, and then it was Packages. All right. So RPM dash IVH, I meaning means to install, V means do it verbose, tell me what you're doing, and H finally says, show me hash marks. OK, hash marks are, are, are like the status bar. And don't we love to see something when something else is happening? Software installation can be fairly long. So you're just staring at the screen, and you don't know if it's going well or not. That's just nerve wracking. So we say uh, RPM-IVH and install. And so now you can see progress is being displayed to me. And you can see also that it's a multi-step process. RPM is able to prepare environment and, and, then, uh, and then do the install. OK, I can also use RPM-UVH. UVH stands for update. And, and that's really most of the time how you're going to install software. Because 
IVH is going to install the new software version next to the old one. It means add the software. A lot of times you don't want to have multiple versions of shells and things like that. So you're going to say you. If you don't have the software in the first place, it'll install it. Uh, or if you already have the software, it'll just tell you so that it's installed. So dash u is best. Now, if I have a new kernel RPM that, that, I'm, uh, that I'm trying to install, which, which option would I use? Should I use lowercase i or uppercase u? I just the isn't very good. Exactly. So for most software, capital U is what you want to use. But specifically, when you have a new kernel RPM, you want to use i because that is going to add in your grub entry, it's going to add, you, add another stanza. So now you can choose which one you're going to boot into. And that's part of RPM. You see, you have the ability to write to scripts and say make an entry in that grub. But the idea is that if the new kernel for some reason is not working well, your your kernel module for your network card is not working, you can reboot and you can't get out on the internet. If that's the only kernel you have, because you upgraded and so you deleted the, the previous stuff. Um, then you can't get, on the, get out on the internet to figure out how to undo it, right? <laughs> Which is sort of chicken and an egg thing. So uh, the best thing for the kernel is to say IVH. And then uh, finally, of course, we can again say RPM-E uh, for the Z shell. You can also use RPM-F, uh, which means to freshen, okay? Uh, to freshen simply means to um, even though if it's installed, make sure to recopy the files anyway. So update will just say, I'm not doing anything, it's already installed. Uh, so for more on RPM, which is a very powerful tool, uh, so it's right here, the freshen process, upgrade or install. Um, let's see. You can rebuild the database if for some reason the database is uh, corrupted or something of that sort. You can rebuild the database of all the packages. Um, you, can, um, you can inquire, for example, if you have an RPM package, what files are included in this RPM package? And it'll show you all the files. So the, the, the database can be queried for many different reasons. OK, so that's, that's RPM. And we are installing everything local. You can bring packages through a media or, for, or download them from the internet. Then we have YUM, which is really a higher level um, process because it lets you resolve dependencies automatically through repositories. Having said that, RPM has the capacity to automatically resolve uh, dependencies. So, before YUM came along, RPM already was able to do that. Um, uh, let me see that option on, on, on RPM. Um, on RPM, you can say query tree. Let's see. Um, install options. Well, I'll recall that in a minute. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a command. I, I don't have to use it anymore because of having yum at my disposal, but uh, there's a way to RPM install resolve dependencies. Um, Dependency hell, yeah, just like the DLL hell <laughs> at the time where dependencies were not 
well tracked. Uh, you could call it uh, a, a dependency hell. Let's see. Uh, that's not it. Yeah, I might have to. Um, I might have to look this up. Basically, there was a process of updating. There was a process of updating the repository, so that way you could actually resolve your dependencies right locally into your um, CD-ROM, and then um, you could do the install RPM dash U, um, and there was like an a flag for automatically resolving dependencies. All right, well, we're not going to spend time looking for that, but uh, but there was a, anyway, RPM was able to do that automatically too. But now if I use yum, I can say yum install z shell, and if there are dependencies, it's taken care of automatically. And so the repositories are going to, um, to install it. Notice that sometimes you will try to run yum, and it'll say that another process has the, da the database locked. And at the same time, you'll notice that your system is running an update. Um, you'll see that there's a process that's actually running your update for, for your system. So basically, yum and the automatic update process, that are all connected to the same database. The same as going to system and then the administration and remove software, right? All of this is using the same resources. So if you're trying to um, query or install software through one of them, you're using really the same backend. Okay, and so add remove software is of course the easiest uh, way to do that, and uh, and and it all has um, uh, yum in the background. Notice it says waiting for package manager lock. See, right now I have it locked with my with my yum command, and when the package manager lock is released in a moment here, the GUI will will be able to continue. Well, I don't need to install it here. All right, momentarily, this is going to release me. For whatever reason, on these virtual machines, sometimes the performance is not as snappy as, as we would hope for. It's as if I wasn't uh, online. It's fine. All right, and so here's the um. Yeah. All right. All right. So that is um, the. A couple of ways of installing software. So let's look at the last software install process, and then uh, by, by using source code. So in this first exercise, let's go ahead and write just a, a very quick C program so we can see the steps, and then we're going to actually use a, an open source program to compile it. I think the textbook uses the R desktop example, which is easy to compile and is easy to use. Only I don't have a Windows machine here with enabled remote desktop, so we couldn't use it. We'll use some other source code. So um, let's go ahead and create a, a program. We'll call it my.c. And in this uh, uh, C program, we'll say something like void main. And um, let's go ahead and say print f and uh, say hello world. And, uh, and now it's a program, 
that's the source code. So when you download source code from the internet, you download humanly readable code that can be modified. And sometimes, um, like in an Apache source code, we go to the source code to modify maybe the tokens that are shown in the HTTP headers. Uh, in most uh, Apache systems, you have the option of making a production level which just says Apache. But what if I don't want to say Apache? I want to say something else. You need to go to the source code, modify that text, and then compile from that source code. So we'll go ahead and save this code. To compile it, I'm going to use GCC. GCC is, is the uh, C compiler that really made open source possible because uh, before that, you had to pay for uh, compilers, Borland or some other ones. You had to pay for them. Therefore, um, it really limited the distribution levels. But now, the, the moment the first compiler was available, you could distribute your so source code with the binary compiler, and now people can compile for themselves. So we, we would say something like GCC, and then go ahead and compile this. And wow, it does, does, it, does it not like my code. Uh, incompatible in position. Uh, so it really does not like my, um, my source. Let's see what I did wrong. Oh, mail. <laughs> it was supposed to be main. I think I said main. I typed in mail. So let's compile it. And now I only have warnings, which I can live with. OK, warnings I can, I can live with. It's like driving a car, right? Uh, so now I'll go ahead and run my program. And the program that got compiled is right here, a.out. I could have given it a nice name. I could have said gcc-o, give it a name, and then whatever you want to compile. But we'll just use the name as is. And when I execute it, it says hello world, which is great. So what we saw is the process of writing software, compiling it, and then executing it. And it's a similar process for all the other software that we'll download from the internet. So let's go ahead and try to download software from the internet. <clears throat> if we go to uh, apache.org, and we will go ahead and um, man, my connection is sluggish. I assume that's why my um, that's why my uh, Yum was not happy a moment ago. OK, how about now? There we go. Um, so if I say yum install ZSH, there we go. So that was the problem. My, my system, because I put it to sleep between classes, it, um, it had network problem. It probably woke up with an IP address that was used by someone else. So I apologize to whoever was unable to connect to the internet a minute ago. Uh, all right, so if I was to, again, kick in the ad remove software, um, it's starting, right, but it says it's waiting for the package manager lock. At the same time, we're installing. And when this is released, this is completed, then the, um, the lock here should be released. Let's see. Refresh. Oh, there you go. So it's querying, and now it has the lock. So if I'm trying to, to run yum, it's not going to allow me until that lock is released. All right. so. Um, so things add up uh, with that. Now, projects, we're going to go to alphabetical list. We're going to visit uh, HTTP, HTTP server. We're going to look at um, downloads. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to download the 2.0 version. Notice that when source code, is, source code is released, okay, it is independent of, of the platform here. It's only when we release compiled software, like we do, well, for, for Windows, we do a special exception here. We have the source code, too. But we have, we have a Windows binary. And uh, if we went to another section for other files, we would have binary versions that were compiled for 64-bit, 32-bit, uh, different types of operating systems. Once you compile it, 
you're committed to that architecture. And notice the extensions. You can have BZ2 compression, or you can have GZ compression, right? So the same compression methods that we discussed. So we're going to go ahead and download um, the source code. And one of the issues with downloading files is that sometimes uh, you download them with some kind of a problem. Um, it could mean that as you save it on the file, you have a broken file system that is a block that is not working correctly. Or maybe there is, uh, which doesn't happen very often, but there might be a network connect connectivity problem, and so you downloaded a file that's now corrupted. Uh, or maybe someone uh, uh, is sitting between us and it's modifying you know, this, this source code uh, and sending us a, a bad copy. So to protect from it, a lot of times, uh, the uh, open source uh, systems are going to show you a digest, a message digest like MD5, to verify that what you downloaded is actually correct, or it's it's the same file as when it was tested in the in the lab, and so you can verify it by saying MD5 sum downloads, and then the file I just downloaded uh, six. Okay, here's the file, and when I run the md5sum, these characters have to be the same as these ones here. So now I know that the file I downloaded is the same as they are what's advertised on this web page. Okay, so here are the steps that we need to take in order to compile this from source code. First, we have to extract and decompress, and we do that with a tar command uh, by saying tar-x extract z decompress with gzip and I know that because the, the extension tells me and then I say uh, vf and go to the downloads file uh, like this and so what we're doing right now is we are decompressing and then extracting perfect so now I have a directory here and this directory was just created this directory has source code in it. Uh, Linux has this package called autoconf and it allows us to automate uh, installation from source code. For example, because source code uh, would apply to multiple distributions, it will be really useful to arrange the source files and arrange the libraries in such a way as it fits our distribution. So there's a program here called configure and you run configure, sometimes it's called just config, you write, run configure, it will, it will figure out, first of all, what's your arch architecture? Is it in, Intel? Is it AMD? What, what is you running? Then it'll see 32-bit, 64-bit. Then it'll go through your libraries and see if you have all the dependent libraries, dependencies. And only after that it'll say you're ready for compiling. So we'll do that by saying configure and I'll use prefix. Prefix is basically the home directory. So where do you want to install the software? If you do not specify prefix, a default layout will take place, which means that your software will get spread out across the operating system, different folders that someone decided are appropriate. You can always uninstall it with just one command, but most of the time if you use prefix like this and then put it somewhere where it is in a custom software folder, then it's easier for you to manage, backup, and work with. So we're going to run configure. And notice that there are answers at the end, either yes or no, yes or no. And uh, it simply means you have this installed, or maybe you don't have it installed. But if it's not required, then configure is not going to uh, basically take it as an error. Sometimes there are libraries that are missing, in which case you have to fix that first and then, and then continue with compiling. All right, so we're checking for all kinds of uh, uh, libraries at this point. When this completes successfully, we're going to move to the next step, which is actually compilation. When you compile, you're going to use um, uh, LD tool and GCC. So LD tool is going to precompile some. Um, some libraries, and then GCC, the same compiler that I used, is going to be visible. So the command to compile is called make. 
And so we go ahead and execute make. And now we can see that, um, so the, the, the lib tool is, is used first. And in a minute we should see the GCC compilers, um, GCC compiler going to work. All right, let's see. All right, so here's here's the GCC, um, and and so we're compiling, we're compiling the uh, the various sources. So again, the configure script is important because it's going to create a file called make file, capital M, and then make file has all the information about your system, and and how it needs to be compiled. When this is successful, the last step is going to be make install. The make command has many parameters. You can say make clean, which means delete all the precompiled binaries and uh, be ready for a new set of configuration directives. You can say make uninstall. So if you install by compiling and it's spread across the entire operating system, you can now say make uninstall and it'll know where to go and remove all your software. Uh, but now I will say make install because so far, you see, when I uh, so far what I have here is uh, a build directory. So you can see my my system things were uh, February one, right? So here are all, all the files. Make file is the one that configure created, and then build has uh, has uh, the um, binary files, and then finally the HTTPD is the actual Apache daemon. I can I can uh, run it and I can see what's inside of what modules have been configured, but I will say make install and when I do that, files that are previously compiled are now moved into their destination location and the location is user local Apache because that's what we specified as prefix. Well, after all this uh, uh, activity, we'll go to user local Apache and all these directories we just created. And now I'm going to say bin and start Apache. And when it runs, I should be able to go to something like localhost and then see my, my, my web page. So what we did is we installed software in three different ways. We started with RPM. It's a binary installation. Someone compiled it for us. Someone prepared it for, in, uh, for our in, uh, infrastructure, uh, for architecture, and we installed it. Then yum goes to repositories, to the specific repository that has software for us. And now we are looking at, um, at uh, a source code level installation. All right, any questions? All right, good deal.